right? This is uh, Family Search, using Family Search effectively, um, sponsored by the Friends of the Drakeit Library, uh, and presented by Richard Reed. He is the director of both the Friends of Irish Research and the David Allen Lambert Library, which are based in Brockton, Mass. And I will let him take it from here. All righty. Well, it's been quite a day. I'm also a computer technical support specialist and it's many hats that I wear, but it is my research into computer solutions that actually became uh, the reason I got into genealogy. Someone learned about my uh, technology skill sets and they invited me to be on their board of their library. And then they realized, oh, you have to pay $50 a year to be a member. And so they paid my membership so that I would be on the board and design computer uh, software for them, but also to help with the research. And so um, I have been at this, it seems like forever, but I know it hasn't been, uh, but I've been able to accomplish quite a bit in my own family research. Uh, my family tree goes back several generations, which are fully documented, but I've also been able to um, help a lot of people. And I, and I did my daughter-in-laws and uh, she's French Canadian. So I actually have her back 22 generations, which were into the early 1500s. So uh, there's a lot that can be out there. So tonight we're actually doing, we're, we're, we've been doing these things backwards, I think. We did the introduction to Genealogy 101. That was perfect place. Then we did uh, Ancestry last month and we're doing family search today. Normally I would flip flop them. Um, one of the reasons I do that is because family search is a free service. So hopefully uh, we'll get a little bit of uh, insight into what you can accomplish on family search. And this is a screenshot of their website. And in the top right hand corner, you will see either sign in or uh, essentially create an account. You do need to have an account in order to utilize their service, even though all their services are free, which is the best price out there. So it's operated by the Church uh, of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. you free to register. It's a wonderful place to do research and acquire proof for your family history. It's also a place to host your family tree. Um, some of you may already be using Ancestry.com or Find My Past or My Heritage. All these sites, and there are many other sites where you're able to host your family tree. Um, a family search allows you to do that as well. However, I will immediately start with a warning. I do not recommend using family search as the place to host your family tree you can find a lot of information but it's open source and so uh, you could have done a lot of digging and research to prove for somebody's in your family tree and then somebody else can just come along and change the name or the date you know, I've had that one happen to one person in my family. I put a little bit out there just to test it. And sure enough, somebody kept coming in and changing one of my um, great aunt's um, birth date and where she was born. And then I would correct it. And then about a week later, I go, look, it'd be changed back to whatever it was. And then I would correct it. A week later, it's changed back. So uh, because it's open source, anybody can make changes. So I do not recommend it as a place to store your family tree. But to find the documents and to find um, hints about who's in your family tree, it's a wonderful tool. So the screenshot there is actually me logging into my, to my account. Now, here's one of the things that's there. They organize things in collections and you can see that it is growing immensely. Way back in 2014, it had 1,837 collections, and that was impressive at that time. 
just about two years later, it had jumped up to 2,101 collections. And as of yesterday, there are 3,046 collections. Now, what has happened that is of major consequence to all of us is that the team at Family Search has finished scanning all of the microfilms that they have. They are not all out there yet. What you will find um, almost on a weekly basis or at least a bi-weekly basis, they'll send out an email saying, here are some of the new collections that we have, or here are some of the additions to some of the collections that we have. And they are well organized. Um, I've provided the link there, the www.familysearch.org slash search slash collection slash list, and you'll get all 3,046 of them. But you can organize it by geographic region if you're only looking in Canada, okay? I'm only interested in the collections that deal with Canada. Or if you're only interested in the ones that are for Scotland, you do the same thing. And then you can also organize it by date, by half century. Now, of course, we realize most every single country has some limitations on the birth records and the death records and marriage records. And so uh, family search is subject to those restrictions as well. But as time goes by, we have more and more records in each of these as the as we have uh, more years that go past either the 50, 75 or 100 year restriction. And you can also sort by types of collections. If you're interested only in cemetery collections, you can do that or in census collections. So um, it's well organized. It's easy to find your way around. So here's a shot uh, of some of the Irish ones. So because we're the Friends of Irish Research, I, a lot of my slides are dealing with the Irish. And uh, one of the things it tells you is that it tells you how many records are in there and when was the last time that they did an update. Now, for the Irish records, it's been a number of years. Some of these haven't been updated since uh, like 2012, 2013. Also, some of these are only images. They've not been indexed yet. Uh, the very top one that I have there is the Iowa State Census. Now, mind you, it's on here for two reasons. One, it's only images. So if you want to search it for somebody, you've got to look at every picture in order to do so. We're always so thankful when they finally get to the indexing part of it. It makes it so much easier to find because then you can use a Boolean search and you're able to find the records. But again, this has not changed in years for the Irish records with a few small exceptions that they've had some corrections. So as they go over the, we'll say the 1901 census again, they find some somebody they missed in the transcription and so they put them in there. So here we are in June of 2016 and here's a, a swath of the um, records that they added. And they're very, it, it, it's so varied, it's funny. Um, we have one here, the Minnesota County Marriages from 1860 to 1949, I think that is. I don't need to find my glasses. Even though it's on a 32-inch screen, there we go, it is 1949. Uh, and then we have a lot of records. Now, look at this one, Ar Argentina, Buenos Aires, Catholic Church records, 1635 to 1981. And then uh, this one, this was an old screenshot that I used, uh, 146 million records in the Find a Grave Index. We also see we have some uh, Italian and Denmark, uh, Honduras, uh, the United Kingdom World War I Women's Auxiliary. And it, you know, so these are really useful collections and they get updated all the time. So here's a shot that I did of the, uh, the Irish ones, and you see some go back to 2012, 
There's been very few changes in there, but on some of the other countries that you do look, look at, you'll find lots of additions and corrections. Now, when we think about the Irish records, one of the things that we often forget about are some of the early, early censuses. And if you look at the list there, the 1821 census, we only have 275,103 records. But then we go to the 31 census, it's now down to 80,000. The 41, we're down to 15,000 records. So what's that telling me? It's telling me that we have very little of these um, census records. If we were to look at the 1901 census, we can tell you that we have what we would say is 99% of the 1901 Irish census, but the 1940, or sorry, 1841 and 1851 census, if you found one of your ancestors in there, that is a time to celebrate because actually what we have is less than 1% of what the actual census was. So we have very few records there. So finding somebody prior to um, you know, the 1830s in Ireland is very difficult. Uh, 1816 is what I call is the cutoff date to try and find proof records. Now, we can find theories, we can find family ideas and lores, but if we do not have proof, Genealogy without documentation is always mythology. It's just somebody's ideas. That's why when we were talking last month about ancestry, you know, the shaky leaf, you know, the hints and, you know, the shaky leaf syndrome, you know, not everything that you find in one of those hints is accurate. And there's no system that's perfect. I get emails almost on a daily basis from one of the various services suggesting a particular person might be my ancestor. There might be a match. Usually within a few minutes, I can tell whether or not it is a good hint or a bad hint. Um, you know, if, if somebody comes up with a read that's from South Carolina, I know it's a bad hint. None of the reads went to South Carolina. Now, someone did, but not in my family. So I can delete those hints right away. So on Family Search, whenever you go into one of these collections, the, the screen looks pretty much the same. It allows you some basic information, first name, last name, the gender, if you happen to know the birthplace, if you happen to know the range of years, use them. The more information that you can provide, the better, the more accurate your research would be. But it is possible to put in too much information. I've done this many times where I, I'm going with the information I've been provided. And when I do the hit the search button, it comes up with zero records. Well, that means that there is no perfect match to the criteria that I put in there. So then I start removing a few things and, uh, and then I get some matches and I can start looking and seeing if they fit into the tree. So you have the marriages and again, it's quite a long uh, period of time for the marriages. Now, again, we do have some records way back as far as 1619 in Ireland, but they are so rare. Uh, actually, once you hit about 1800, the only records that you're going to find in Ireland are the records of the Quakers. And I know I say it every time I use the word Quaker with talking about Irish records, is I still can't wrap my head around it that Quakers lived in Ireland, but they kept immaculate records. It's much like um, the Jesuit priests did in Quebec for the uh, Quebecois records. Um, if you have family, French Canadian record uh, ancestors, the records there are wonderful. And it, it's, it never surprises me when somebody says, oh, I got back to the 1600s and it's all documented. 
So that's the thing I'm looking for. I'm not looking for somebody's story or idea. I'm looking for proof. I'm looking for ideally three pieces of documentation that will prove that that person existed and that they fit into my family tree. Sometimes we have to settle for one, but one is far better than none. So I know if you're going on ancestry.com and you were searching, you know, and you're searching family trees and the, you know, I had one I was looking at trying to fill one little part of the family yesterday. And um, I had a choice. I had a choice between two trees that each had two documents, two citations that were proofs. One of them actually had the document there. And then there was one that was called unsourced. I just deleted the unsourced one because there's no proof. And uh, the woos, get it right, family search helps us to provide those proofs because they have been documenting and indexing them. So the tithe appointments in Ireland, again, you see the search engine is basically the same except it changes some of the criteria based upon the type of collection. So now we're looking at tax assessment years. All right, again, if you have an idea where the family was and about when they were there, this would be very helpful. Now, this is the one I always love showing this slide uh, in any presentation, and that's the prison records. Now, um, Prison records in Ireland are not like prison records anywhere else. Um, many people have said to me, so, oh, I don't want to look there because I don't want to know that there was a scoundrel in my family. Well, actually, that kind of makes our family interesting when we find the scoundrels. But in the Irish prison records, not only does it have the information about the criminal, it has the information about the victim of the crime. And sometimes it has some simple things in there, like, you know, uh, Patrick Murphy um, spent the night in the local jail because he was found intoxicated at the pub. That's all it tells you about. But it also then says it is Patrick Murphy who lives at this particular place in this particular townland. That's the information we're really looking for. Um, so the prison records in Ireland um, is, a, is a great place to, to look for family. Now, sometimes you'll find yourselves looking in court records. And again, if you know the basic vicinity, you can look at the probate place, putting in the county where you think they lived. Now, I'm showing the Irish records here, but this applies to any country. So the same breakdown that the family search has for the Irish records, it has for the English, Welsh, the Scottish, the German, and every other country you can imagine. Of course, death records. Um, notice the start date here, 1864. That's the start of civil records in Ireland. So, you know, prior to that, you'd have to be dependent upon church records. And even afterwards, church records is a good place to look for deaths because it may have the registration information at the church for the burial and even identify the cemetery. Um, civil records do not always give you all the information. And again, it's a very short period of time that has expanded uh in other search engines uh than in family search so here's uh civil registrations again some go back to 1845 but it is not the norm 1864 is when they officially began but there were some uh, as far back as 1845 and thankfully uh, you can get them up to 1958, and I'm expecting this year that it will go up to 1963 or 64. Now, another place to look, and this is all across Family Search, any country is any types of wills, testaments. Again, the range is varied. Now, of course, you see the criteria has changed. Oh, we're back to just the first and last name. 
But we can then look at if we know the birth or the residence, the death date, if we happen to know the name of the spouse or the parents, these things would be named in a will. It allows us to search. What we're looking for always are documents. That's the key. We're always looking for documents. Uh, searching family trees is not something I do very often. Every once in a while I do it when I get stuck because I'm looking for an idea. I'm looking for a name that I may not have that would be that would be useful in my research. And not so much in my own family, but when I'm helping somebody else do research, I will look at a family tree to get an idea of where to go next. But ultimately, it is trying to find the documents. So again, here we mentioned that, but we saw these numbers earlier about how few of some of the early censuses there were um, in Ireland. Now, in the middle here, there's an interesting one for 1841 and 1851. They have what's called the census search forms. And what these are, are records of people that are researching for somebody that were done way back when. Now, why is it so important to know about the 1841 and the 1851 census in Ireland in particular? And this will apply to almost any country. See, it's because in the early 1900s, they invented this wonderful thing called old age pension. And you had to be a certain age in order to qualify. You know, here in America, uh, you can actually start it at 62, but you really take a big hit. If you wait all the way to 70, you get your full Social Security pension. Well, in the early 1900s, the Irish wanted to take advantage of this new system that was developed. Now, the only thing you had to do is prove that you were 65 years old. The only problem is it was before there were civil records. It was, um, and the census records were gone. We have, like I say, only 1% of the 1841 and the 1851 census. So all of a sudden you could make up your age, whatever you want it to be. Now, there were records when we look at the 1901 census, we see somebody might have been 45 years of age. Now, let's go with 55 years of age. Now, in the 1911 census, we would expect them to be, and this is really easy, easy math, 55 plus 10 equals 65, they would qualify. But what if they were 45? what they said in the 1901 census, but they wanted to get their pension. Maybe they just had a little bit too much gray hair and they said, you know, I wanna get my pension. And so they simply just lied on the 1911 census. So instead of aging 10 years, they may have aged 17 years and now will be eligible for their old age pension. So, don't always believe uh, what they say their age is in the Irish censuses, um, particularly the 1911 one, it changed radically. So here's the 18, go way back to 1821. If, and we're gonna flip through several screens quickly here that, you know, tell you about what was there. Uh, lots of information. What we're really looking for always in Ireland in particular is the town land and the civil parish. Um, you know what happened when they came, when the Irish came to America and this happened with all groups. They showed up in Boston and they showed up in New York or wherever and somebody's sitting on the dock with a clipboard and they write down their name and they ask, where are you from? And they said, Ireland. And that's all they record. We know they're from Ireland. What we want to know is we want to know what county and ideally what townland they came from. The townland in Ireland is so specific that it would be like a neighborhood in one of our communities. In the city of Brockton, you know, we're we're a fairly large city. I think it's 38, about 38 square miles. Um, our street 
is the last street in Brockton or the first street in Brockton, depending upon which way you want to look at it. And we are a neighborhood. There's about two, three streets right at the end of, of uh, Brockton. And we, that, that's what we would consider our neighborhood. It's not a very big area, but we would be considered a townland in Irish records. So uh, now we also have, and this happens in a lot of countries, the family search, it breaks it down, as you can see. So instead of looking for very specific name sensitive ones, we can break it down by county. And of course, you can see in 19, 1821, they don't even have records for every single county. Uh, two of the counties there, uh, no, actually three of the counties that are listed there, Mayo, Galway, and Limerick, are all counties where our youngest son has lived. He is currently living in Mayo and uh, was up visiting Galway just uh, last week. But uh, again, county records are useful. If you happen to be able to know the parish, whether the civil parish or the church parish, we can now break down and look in that particular area. Now, in this one, I'm looking at one that's uh, down in the first column there. Uh, hold on a second. Kill Reek Kill has been a very important one. We've had several people want to do research in that particular um, area. And that's a, par a particular parish, and that's a part of the county. And then we can actually break it down uh, here into the actual townlands. And so I show you an example here of in County Galway Parish, Athenry, we have all these townlands. And there's several more, as you can see by the bar over the far right, that uh, it scrolls down much further. So this is what we're looking for. All, the, all those slides there, just to show you, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for a document that has the name of our ancestor. This is a proof document. Now this one gets very specific. It gets down to uh, Athenry Town, so that's the town land, but they must have had some place called Abbey Lane. And so that was the name of the little street that the person lived on. And so this type of document, this is, this is what we're looking for. Um, you know, I've had people, you know, come to us uh, before saying, well, I'm going to Ireland and I want to, I want to find the old family um, homestead, and, but I'm leaving in two weeks. And it's like, you know, no, this is a two year research usually to try and find it that specific. But this is an example of one that we did for somebody where we actually found the name of the street where their ancestor lived on. Doesn't happen that way all the time, but this is the type of thing we're looking for, a document that proves our family. So again, here, you know, we're looking at the 1821 census. Now, what's over on the far right-hand side of the screen, this is what's really, really important. The citation. Once you have found information about your ancestor, you need to write down and record where you found it. And so this is the official citation here. Now, actually, it ends with the colon down here at the bottom. I add this extra piece here, accessed when. Now, sometimes I get very specific and put the date that I actually did it, because guess what? Websites change. And so this record may not be found in that exact same place today. So I put it, I put a date associated when I found it so that I have that in my records. And if I need to really prove it, there is a way to do it. See, archives.com has a service called the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine, essentially, it indexes the internet. And so you can sometimes, with the way it's done, 
you can go back to a particular date and they take a picture of that website and you can search the website on that date. So if the, somebody rearranges their website, you know, uh, you've proven it here where you got the information. I, I just didn't make this up. I actually searched it out. So then the 31, again, now, this is an important slide, not because it's talking about the 1831 census, that the majority of the census returns were destroyed in 1922 in the Great Fire as a part of the rebellion or uh, the Civil War or whatever you want to call it in Ireland. I am excited that in April of 2022, they are going to release a rebuild of everything that was lost in that fire. The one thing that the Irish did well is they indexed everything. They knew what they had in the library. And now they have teams of people working, uh, going scouring the countryside and they're finding the original documents. So when the order was given by the church to send all the parish records to Dublin, and most of them said, no, those are ours, and we'll send you some copies. We'll send you, a, we'll send you copies of a particular segment of history, you know, timeline. That was all they did. They kept the originals. So now they've gone. They have found everything that was destroyed in that fire, and it's been digitized, and it's going to be released in April of 2022 as a free online database that we're going to be able to access. This is huge. Um, uh, nothing like this has ever been done before in any country. Now, again, as you go through the different censuses, they have different information that's available. Uh, again, the National Archives had everything. Find My Past is a partner here in some of these records and you'll find, you might find an easier search, more records there than you would uh, at Family Search, but we're talking about Family Search tonight. Uh, the, the search forms from 40, for 41 and 51, again, this was actually used as a proof. If somebody was looking for someone in a particular county or townland during these census years, um, that is now considered proof that the person existed. Even though you can't find them in the 41 or 51 census, the fact that somebody was asking about them apparently is enough proof. So again, the biggest thing for that was because of the old age pension. All right, so here's an extract from the 1851 census search form. It gives us a lot of information about who was looking and what the address was. And, uh, it's very useful information. Gives us uh, way down at the bottom. It can give us the date and time of what date of when they were looking for them and when they expected them to be. But you know, sometimes you know we're just looking for something that's going to allow us to pinpoint better our family. And one of these search forms. Uh, may be the, the key that we need. All right, so again, each census adds a little bit more information. Um, important about this, uh, some of them include the date of the marriage or at least the year of the marriage, um, the status of their literacy or their education level is provided there. And so that's kind of, a, again, a useful tool. Uh, now, although we find all this information on Family Search, the actual index for it was created by Find My Past. So these big companies, they do work together, and I'm so glad of that. So we find the, you know, we've been going through the historical record collections. We can get very specific for what we're looking for. Now, some of the collections are still only digitized images. They haven't been indexed yet. Um, now, Family Search, as they're going through and adding new records, are trying to not only digitize but index them at the same time. 
and it's going to make life a lot easier for us to do search. But as we see some of these, so many other countries that are being um, added, the one that comes to mind often for me is Italy. And I think about uh, the, the records in Italy. Most records were damaged or destroyed because, you know, they had to deal with World War I and World War II. And uh, many of the um, Slavic companies, they've had the same, the deal with the same things. Um, try to try and do some research in Poland. Was it Poland? Was it a different name? Was it Prussia? Was it Russia? Was it Germany? Uh, the same town may have ended up over history being in four or five different countries. The town did not move. But whoever was in control during that time period, that's what the proper name would be. And so I, I run into this all the time when I do any research in my wife's family because they're from Poland and it just kept changing all the time. Uh, particularly if it's in a border region. So that's something you have to be uh, remember, reminded of. Now, if there's only images, Family Search will tell you that it's only images. They'll say browse images. It won't be an index. If it's a hyperlink, it'll be to an index and you'll be able to search it. Just like all those slides we saw where you put in the name and any other information you have. But when it gets to some of these collections that are only images, you have to scroll your way through them. And that can be tedious. Now there is in most of them, what I call a pseudo index in that they have been sorted by county or by town. And so you just have to go through that one town if you know that's what you're looking for. So Family Search also has something called Wiki. And uh, the Wiki helps will give you better understanding of some of the documents that you're going to find. Um, it is, you know, under what circumstances and why were these records created? There's a little bit of background there. That's a good thing to understand. So uh, they have this thing called Wiki Helps, which again is a huge help file, very useful, broken down again by topics. So here I want to throw in one of those uh, record images. Now, I think children today are going to have a hard time today and in the future because they are not learning how to read or write cursive. And so a lot of these documents are going to look very strange to them in the future. And uh, so getting an understanding and learning how to read cursive is kind of a criteria for a lot of historical records. And again, depending upon the clerk, uh, they can get pretty ornate when it comes to uh, some of the letters that they create. So again, finding the records, that is what we want. This is what's called the genealogical proof standard. And again, is it just somebody, you know, signing a document? Like, you know, I can, you know, here I am uh, holding up a quick business card. You know, well, you can't see it with my background. But, uh, you know, just because somebody's got a business card, does that make them really that, you know, work for that company or not? No, not in this day and age. Anybody with a, with a computer and a printer and uh, like, a uh, kit from Staples can make a business card. Uh, you don't have to have professionally done ones like that one is. Uh, it's just because it's there doesn't mean it's real. So we got to look at the genealogical proof standard, the background about that type of data that's there. Now, if I get a death certificate from a state or a province, and it's got a seal on it, okay? That's kind of important. That, that means it's real. If you, if you go to send in to get a passport or something, they want the original documents. It always scares me when I'm sending in original documents to 
the government for whether a passport renewal or whatever it is, because I want the original. I want to keep those. I, I went and obtained those for a reason. And I hate them going out of my, you know, out of my safe. I want them to stay there forever and be available whenever I need them. But uh, because they have the official seal on it, that means it's the real deal. So this is why we use the genealogical proof standard. It's the minimums that a genealogist must do with our work to make sure that it's credible. We want to make sure that the evidence is reliable. I always tell the story about my cousin who started our family tree. And, um, you know, over 40 years ago now, and she did, you know, there's some wonderful work in there. However, she started off on page one and it really messed it up because she had the name of my great great grandfather wrong and had his wife's name wrong and had a wonderful story in there. Uh, part of which we know is true, but um, apparently there's a Scottish castle with my name on it somewhere in Scotland, but I can't find it. Um, I've searched and I cannot find any evidence that there is really a castle that belongs to the Reed clan. Uh, it just, it isn't there. It was a wonderful story that she made. It sounded so sad, the story as the family starting out as far back as she could go, and it was all wrong. Now, of course, when you get your the name of the first person and the name of the first person's spouse wrong, uh, here's hoping that the rest of it's in better shape. And I can tell you the rest of it she had was in better shape. Um, and there were a lot of people that I knew in my youth, and uh, so I could verify it. You know, that way it made it easy to find um, proving it. But being the one of the two researchers that actually found out that the name that she started with uh, were wrong, uh, we, how did we do that? We found proof documents to show it. We had to find evidence that was reliable. And then, of course, how did we... This last, the second to last thing down here, the or third to last thing, the contradictory evidence. How did you, how did you resolve it? Well, in my great great grandfather's case, it was very easy to resolve. See, I found an eighteen thirty nine marriage record of it with the proper names that we knew that they were, but in eighteen fifty two they converted from um, Methodism to um, Catholicism. And so he then took on a new name when he got baptized as a Catholic. All of a sudden, he started going by Joseph instead of William. And it's like, oh, once we understood what happened, it was much easier to go ahead and, um, you know, resolve the contradictory evidence that was out there. All right, now, uh, the advantages of collections. Uh, I see a question right away. Can you add obituaries to a person if so? Yes, you can. Obituaries are wonderful. Now, hold on a second, I can find it here, where it went. Okay, another place that you can do great research are the cemeteries. All right. Now I gotta, I haven't scanned this yet. I need to scan it and make it part of my presentations. But there is a name here, it's Zara M, 1923 to 1999. And this is a headstone that's in situate, one of the cemeteries. I don't know if you're gonna be able to, uh, it's like a, on her headstone says, I told you I was sick. And I just love that. I mean, they, she had a great, the woman must have had a great sense of humor. That's, that's forever on her headstone. I told you I was sick. So uh, the cemeteries are a great source. And now Family Search has huge collections of cemeteries because they have partnered with um, 
billion graves and find a grave. And so we have all those indexes in there and they're in family search. So again, as we started off with collections and that, uh, they are uh, very valuable because we can uh, put it ourselves into a search pattern that you know gets very specific for our family. Kind of look at my phone to see what time it is, because sometimes I can go along with this. But uh, so the, the collections here, you see the three uh, benefits here, refining the search to a specific country or region, uh, refining the search to a more specific time frame, and then to a specific type of record. Again, we're looking always for birth, marriage, and death records. But you know, there are other types of records we want to look for. We want to look for work records and pension records. And if you're in the, you know, for the Irish research, prison records. Uh, these things help us. Well, I'm, I'm not only trying to find out who all my ancestors are. I'm trying to find out what their life was like. What did they do? I'm, I'm looking at the bookcase behind my desk here. And at the top of it, I can see a picture of my, of my dad's parents, my grandparents um, that was taken uh, on our wedding day, uh, my wife and I, and I see, but right behind it, I have a carpenter's plane. It's a big one. And it belonged to my great grandfather. He was a ship's carpenter. And my grandfather, who I knew very well, um, he too was a ship's carpenter. And so he used his father's tools. And I have a number of their tools that they used. And if I could see over my screen here, I'd see a bureau that uh, a chest of drawers that my great grandfather built. And then some 30 years ago, I refinished it. And uh, so it was built by a Richard Reed and it was uh, refinished by a Richard Reed. So finding you know, our history like that is, is great to be able to get things like that. Of course, here it is. I mentioned this early, earlier. All the microfilms have been scanned. Over 12 billion names and images. I think you might find somebody in your family in these records. Now, here are some of the newest additions. I mentioned that it's almost on a bi-weekly or at least a, sometimes a weekly um, release. They tell us what they've added. So here's November 1st, just a few days ago, really. And so we see a lot of uh, ca free Catholic records from Peru going back to 1603, Bolivia back to 1566, Guatemala, 1581, Mexico, 1514, uh, Venezuela, 1577, all the way up to 1995. That's pretty amazing. And then we have in Argentina, we have cemeteries that are listed there. Now, these are expanded collections. These are new collections. Now here, even in the United States, where we have records about everything under the sun, they added some new ones from the Bureau of Land Management track books. And look at this, even here in Massachusetts, Boston tax records, 1822 to 1918. And then why did we not have these already? But Virginia marriages back to 1771 and some other vital records. You know, these were added on November 1st, just two weeks ago. And then even newer ones. These were added uh, the next week. And again, over 1 million new Catholic church records from Mexico. And it gives you some very specific information as to where. You now again, this is not all of Mexico. It's giving the particular uh, communities in Mexico where these records came from, but a million of them. And then in England, we have several more uh, here, the Middlesex Parish Registers, and a little country of Sierra Leone, Germany, Samoa, 
and in the United States, things from Georgia, Minnesota, and Virginia. It's always changing. So if you go looking tonight and you can't find and you can't find something, go look at it again in two months time and it might be there. I know this for a fact because I was always looking for my grandparents' marriage record and I couldn't find it. It didn't exist. I searched on Ancestry, it wasn't there. I searched on a family search, it wasn't there. But I did find it in a very small database that was kept by a group in Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. And so I got an image of their marriage record and I had it for, I think, four years. And then I decided to do another search in family search and sure enough, they now have it. Where did they get it? They got it from the same place that I did, but I had it four years before they did. Uh, so they're always adding to it. Now let's, we're gonna try and run through some tips quickly here. There's so many records out there. So you have to ha have some sort of methodology as to how you're going to find them. So check the exact search box, okay? That's important to do. If you know information to be correct already of who you're looking for, check the exact box. Now, I was looking up for somebody yesterday in my family, and I know, I know for a fact that the man's name is Francis Kelly. But that's not how he's known. And that's actually not how he's in my family tree database. He is known to us as Pinky Francis Kelly. Now, I don't know where he got the nickname Pinky, but that's how he was known by everybody. So, you know, the exact search box will not help me in trying to find him. Also, you can use wildcards. If you're not really sure about this particular spelling in that, you can use the wild cards like in any Boolean search. Um, the asterisk will replace one or more characters and the question mark replaces a single character. So that works. And these work uh, with and without the exact search. Narrow it by the date or the event. You know, birth, marriage, or residence. Residence is always important. Uh, death, you can uh, search it by date into a particular they were born about 1850. You know, um, when I'm using a search range of I think they were born in 1850, I'll do 1845 to 1855, you know, allowing for a little bit of leeway um, because, you know, sometimes records were not submitted in a timely fashion. All right, the third one is narrow by relationship. Do you know the spouse's name? Do you know the parent's name? Do you know any of the children's names? You can put that in your criteria. And again, all we're trying to do is to narrow down the responses to our search for records. And then of course we can do it by uh, collection over the, the over 3000 collections. I'm sure you're gonna find one that will be helpful to you. Again, if you know the country, that's the first place to start. And then uh, once you have started to get a list here, you know, you, you, you can reduce uh, the criteria, let less amount of things or more, whatever it is, either direction in order to get a better result. Now, if you're looking for Patrick O'Sullivan, in Ireland, you're going to get thousands and thousands of hits, just like you would if you got asked for Robert Murphy. You know, there, there's thousands of them. So you need to put in some other criteria. If you put a, a Murphy that came from County Cork, that will help reduce the number. So instead of getting 10,000 responses, you may get 750 responses. Now it's a lot easier to weed through 750 things than it is 10,000 things. So that's a good tip for you there. And then again, this is added as a secondary, you, it's filtering. Again, 
the more you filter, the better the results are going to be. I've actually had a few where I've done it, um, and not necessarily on Family Search, but on some of the other uh, uh, websites, databases. By putting in enough criteria, um, I've actually been able to get back just four records. And it's really easy to, you know, all you have are four hits. Now to search those and see where they take you, again, the better your filtering, the better your results. Um, you can also browse as well as search. Again, many of the records are only as images. And yes, it is time consuming. Yes, it is tough on the eyes, but we've been able to find great records this way. Ultimately, someday, all these records will be indexed and it'll be much easier to search. Doing that Boolean search is really easier than browsing all the images, but sometimes all we have are the images. And then, of course, we can always search by surname variants, the different spellings of the, of the name, nicknames. All right, got to go find Pinky. Um, I just, again, I have no idea why. Uh, there could be alternate surnames. We use the wildcard search. And I've had some people that I just can't find. But I know they're part of a particular family. And so I know siblings' names. And so I search through the siblings' names and I find something particular like the parents. That's what I was looking for. I have this person, I'm looking for their parents, but I can't find any record where, you know, the parents of this man is mentioned, but in a brother or sister's record, I can find the parents. And that means I've gone back a generation. So Sometimes you have to search through uh, other family members. So again, here's an up-to-date screen of the, you know, searching through the catalogs, which is a slightly different than the collections here. Um, they do have ties to other large databases out there that you can access. And they, um, so here's what a catalog, it's simply a guide and it's going to take you through where to find the images. Um, now, I have a video to use that, and I'm not going to bother tonight. I've done that in the past, but uh, I'm not sure how you would see it on Zoom. So in person, I would do that. Now, Family Search also has the capability of not only searching through records, but it does search through genealogies. Again, although I recommend, do not recommend putting your genealogy uh, tree out there. Many, many people do. And again, I've searched them looking for hints, looking for a possibility of somebody else in my family. So uh, they do have them. It is a way of searching. As you see, they also have many family history books. This is a gold mine. Um, different libraries are are in there. The top one, Allen County Public Library. I think I have a slide coming up showing them. A fantastic source. Uh, I love going through history books, um, particularly when I'm looking at the you know, like Irish research. I have a digital collection that I search through. Uh, it's all PDF files, and so I can search with Control F and try to find the name. And it has been amazing how many uh, people I've researched for that I find their name um, in a county record, a town record, a history book. Um, a year ago, we had to do some work here at our local church. We needed to replace the roof. And the only way we're gonna be able to do it was to you know, refinance. And the bank was a piece of cake. However, there was a land lawyer that just was a stickler. He was trying, you know, he just rejected every document that we had. The church is 135 years old. It's written up in history books about the city of Brockton. The founding of the church is listed in the history book. It's covered there. 
everything. It's just, it's splattered all over the records of the city. And this attorney was disputing it. He says, well, you can't prove that you exist. And so uh, one of the things I did, well, what the bank wanted me to do was to hire a lawyer to do it, which would have cost me anywhere from five to $10,000. But being a genealogist, I'm pretty good at research. And so I, I went to the county uh, record of deeds because the congregation had owned over the years, buildings had been donated to them. They were sold. And all these records are at the county record of deeds in Plymouth. Well, this lawyer's opinion was, well, that doesn't mean squat. That doesn't mean a thing. That doesn't prove anything. Now, the fact that most of these documents are notarized, most of these documents were signed off by lawyers, some by judges, but they mean absolutely nothing. This was devastating to me. I, I, I never heard of this before that, uh, that anybody would reject records that are found in the uh, registry of deeds. So I ended up going to the Secretary of Commonwealth and sending them the same information, 74 pages of information. And they said, I don't know what the guy's problem is. So they made a new declaration. They reincorporated the church. The only problem that they did on it is they got the date wrong. Uh, instead of 1886, they made it 1884, which was recorded in a diary that a group of people met together under an apple tree to discuss starting a church. And so they made that the start date instead of the actual June 4th, 1886. Um, but what I found interesting in my research is that there were so many historical documents and books that talked about the particular church. So the same thing is true with people. It, we find information all the time. So there's this huge collection on family search. I've used them uh, over the years. Uh, this is probably the best of the best out there, the Allen County Public Library. And um, their records are uh, immaculate and their search engine is wonderful in trying to do your family research. So the secret to your success is never give up. Keep looking and document your results and cite your sources. When I, in the past, I have taught computer classes in local colleges and trade schools. Um, one of the th things I always had them learn. It was one of the first classes. I said, all right, I'm going to teach you a mantra. And your mantra is this, document, document, document. And that's what we need to do as genealogists, as we're doing family research, whether it be as a professional, it's especially true, but even as an amateur, just doing your own family tree, document what you find. And that includes citing the source. Where did I find this information? My cousin that did the work some 40 years ago, on the first page where she got names wrong and the story wrong, she cited one source. I want to thank Aunt Bessie for sharing all of this with me. Aunt Bessie was my grandmother. And she was the only source for everything that was in there. Now, all the names the family organ structure, everything was accurate. Dates were accurate, often though only recording a year, not the month and day for births and that. Uh, it just wasn't enough information, but the actual structure was good. And I used that as the grounds for my initial family tree because so much was covered in there and so many families and branches were covered in there, but it was just not documented. So document your results, cite the source, and never, never give up. And you'll never hear a genealogist or family researcher say, I'm finished. It's all done. 
I got asked the other day, you know, say somebody to, for me to send a copy of my family tree that I completed. The word is that was wrong was completed. There's a lot more work to be done. So the Friends of Irish Research is a group of friends. Um, between us, we have over 100 years of experience uh, doing the research. Uh, we will be reopening the library and everything you know, more often. Right now, it's by appointment only. Uh, once all this COVID thing goes away, uh, we can get back to some regular hours. I noticed I forgot that I saved the wrong file here. We're, we no longer meet at the ICC library in Canton, but used to go over there and help them out. But we have our own library now. Uh, many of you know who David Allen Lampert is. He's the chief genealogist at NEHGS in Boston, the oldest genealogical society in America. And um, we named the library after him because uh, he donated a lot of books, and that seemed to be the good, the right thing to do. And they, and Dave and I are good friends, and uh, he's a regular speaker there when we have our lectures. And uh, our collection is growing by leaps and bounds. We started off with one little room, and now we're cut. We've encompassed three large rooms, and right now we have over one hundred boxes of books to be able to sort through catalog and get them on shelves. Um, I just picked up another collection from a, a private collection this past Monday. Um, it's a great place to research. We have access to all of the online sources, uh, the databases, Find My Past, uh, Root, I, Roots Ireland, uh, Ancestry. Of course, anybody can access uh, find, uh, Family Search. But we are a family search affiliate library. So that means that there are records that you can only access at an affiliate library that you cannot access anywhere else. And I believe the Drakeit Library is also a family search affiliate library now. Yes, we are. All right. So, so from inside the building at any of our public computers, you can access it that way. And that's, you know, and again, it's it's a matter of what records there's they've held back i guess that's the way to describe it some of the records from the general public and you can only get it through affiliate library and um it's been a there's only surprisingly a handful of affiliate libraries in massachusetts it's something new that's uh, been starting in recent years and so as I said, we're an affiliate library, so we can get things that you don't have anywhere else. And, you know, you start joining all kinds of different organizations. The only thing I noticed, I can tell you right there, is the membership fees are getting to be higher and higher. But uh, we want to be part of all these different groups because it makes a difference in finding information. Um, not only am I looking for my own tree materials, but we are here in our team. We have a lot of volunteers that are available to help do family research. Um, but family search is a great place. It's the number one place that I tell people to start because it's free. Otherwise, you could end up spending three, two, three thousand dollars a year if you wanted to get all the memberships. So let us do that and uh, utilize your local library for the affiliate status or again you're always welcome to come down to brockton um, i always tell people we're in the safe part of brockton you know we're, we're one mile from the avon border which is the quiet part of town uh, but brockton's brockton's had a bad rap over the number of years but it is getting better and uh, we're real thankful we can be a big part of the community there in providing this type of uh, source of information. So um, do we have any questions? 